This is the Naked Genetics Podcast, taking a look inside your genes. This month, we're taking a trip into the world of developmental genetics, finding out how an animal grows from one cell into many millions as it develops from a fertilised egg, and discovering how it knows when it's grown enough. You know, different species of dogs, and even with like related species like wolves, have very similar genetic materials, or they're very similar at the, at the, the DNA, the level of their DNA, and yet their size and shape varies amazingly. We also hear about the hunt for genes involved in autism, see what stickleback can tell us about evolution, ponder the purpose of keeping 9,000 placentas and ask whether we can ever genetically engineer humans to drink seawater. And the monster raving loony gene of the month is the wacky sounding lunatic fringe. This is the Naked Genetics podcast for April 2012 with me, Dr Kat Arney, brought to you in association with the Genetics Society, online at genetics.org.uk. For me, one of the most amazing things in biology is how a single fertilised egg cell can grow into a whole organism, whether it's a fruit tree or a fruit fly, a hamster or a human. To find out more about how this process happens, I spoke to David Ishhorovitz, who heads up the Developmental Genetics Laboratory at the Cancer Research UK London Research Institute. In the case of of, of a mammalian embryo, probably the first decision that's taken is when there are enough cells that some of the cells are on the inside and other cells are on the outside, those two types of cells become different. And the outside cells become kind of accessory cells that aid the inside cells to form the actual mature animal. In the case of other animals, we work a lot on fruit flies. You actually start off by making a embryo which has a few thousand cells and at that point actually the embryo then knows its front from its back and its top from its bottom and it also knows that it's going to make a segmented a repeated uh, animal and so from then on it refines these initial asymmetries into what ultimately becomes a very complicated animal. You might think a fly is simple but in fact When you look at it in detail, it's pretty complicated and it's just as difficult for us to envisage how you'd make a fruit fly as how you'd make a human being. It's just a matter of scale. And indeed, what's been exciting over the last 30 years or so is the discovery that um, the genes that are important in making a fruit fly are actually the same genes that are important in making a human being. And that's quite crazy because they are such different processes I remember if I cast my mind back that the fruit fly egg has you know a a front and a back and it's it's very organized whereas a mammalian egg looks a bit different and a bit less well organized but you're saying that it's actually the same genes that are controlling the subsequent process after that the same genes are always used but not always in the same way um, because there's only a limited repertoire of genes, so you use them again and again, and they do different things in different contexts. I think the fruit fly is unusual because it does quite a lot of its patterning is done in the mother as an unfertilized egg, whereas in the case of a human embryo, um, most of that patterning happens after fertilization. I think what it comes down to is that because you only have a limited number of genes and limited number of ways in which they interact, you've got a limited number of building blocks, but you can use those building blocks in many different ways. Just as when you build a house, you may have a fixed set of components, but you can build radically different houses. The same is true of animals. And quite subtle differences in timing uh, can make apparently big differences in the final appearance of the animal. But actually underneath it all, it's really not as different as you might think. I mean, at the end of the day, for example, if you have a muscle cell, what a muscle cell does is it takes chemical energy and converts it into movement. And once evolution had worked out a way of doing that, it's stuck with it because that's what you do. You use what works. So obviously there are differences between muscles in flies and in humans, but there are massive similarities in the way they work as well. Tell me a bit about what you've got going on in your lab at the moment. What questions are you really trying to get to the bottom of? 
I suppose the thing we're most interested in are the asymmetries. The fly is a particularly strong example whereby the asymmetry of a final animal, the complicated architecture, is, is anticipated by asymmetries very early in development and, in fact, by asymmetries in a, within a single cell. So we're interested in how a single cell can have a front and a back and a top and a bottom. What are the cues that set up these spatial differences? And that turns out to be the putting of particular chemicals in particular places when you're building the cell. And so you can put one particular chemical at the front of the cell uh, and a different chemical at the back of the cell, and now you've got a difference between the front and the back, and so on and so forth. We're interested in the different kinds of mechanisms whereby that can happen. One of those mechanisms in the fly is actually to use little what we call molecular motors that take energy and move molecular cargoes to particular places in the cell where they are needed. Now, that's a particular use of molecular motors. In fact, they're used very widely throughout development to put things in the right place. So it's an incredible mental image of a a tiny, tiny cell and all these motors scuttling around, delivering things to one end, to the other end, and then as it begins to divide to make an embryo, you're you're separating off these different types of of cargo from different ends. It, It is indeed very exciting. And one of the, I think, breakthroughs in the last... 10 to 15 years is that microscopy has allowed us to actually see these uh, process, uh, these movements. I mean, the advances in microscopy means we can image where things are and watch them move and actually, I mean, it's aesthetically very beautiful to see some of the time-lapse movies that people can make of things moving around cells um, to just to be placed in the right position for them to work. And these are in, in living, developing organisms. Indeed, you can now do it. I mean, you used to have to study the thing, uh, animals or the tissues when things were dead, but increasingly we can look at things actually happening because the sensitivity of the microscopes and the resolution of the microscopes and the techniques of labelling molecules so that you can see them have improved beyond recognition. Where next for this field? What do you think are the, the big questions that we still need to figure out? We know a lot of the components we, uh, that are involved. We've, I mean, we know the gene sequences, and we know we can kind of... We, we know a lot of the words involved in building the book that's an animal because we know the genes and we know the pro, what proteins they make, but we don't necessarily know what the proteins do, and we don't necessarily know how they work together. And so I think a lot of the logic behind it is still, is still to be discovered exciting things for the future I suppose are to take what we know already and extend them amongst other things into how the nervous system works the real logic behind the very very complicated circuitry in, in a, even a fruit fly a fruit fly brain um, uh, that I think is going to happen gradually over the next years we know so much more than we thought we would know 20 years ago but we're still scratching the surface about many other things. That was David Ishhorovitz from the London Research Institute. Coming up later, we'll be finding out how organisms know when to stop growing when they've got big enough. But first, it's time for a look at this month's top genetic stories with science writer Nell Barry. So what have you got for us this month? So the first one is looking at the genes behind autism and this is researchers in America and they've looked at about 600 families who've got people with autism in the family and they've actually found three new high-risk genes. But it also looks like the whole disease is a lot more complicated in terms of which genes are contributing than we thought before. Because I think there's, there, it was thought there's about 200 genes involved in autism but now this new study puts the number at about... A thousand? That that seems very complicated. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it just, I mean, it's a behavioural disease, so it's kind of what would be expected, I suppose, that there's lots of different changes that can maybe cause the same types of symptoms in people. And they've actually looked at um, gene mutations that are not inherited from the parents, but are just arising spontaneously. So just little changes that happen by accident, randomly. So this is more likely to be relevant to autism in the whole population then, rather than kind of specifically inherited syndromes do you think yeah it sounds like that and I mean I guess it's another one of those things where you can look at all these different changes figure out how common they are as a background sort of thing and then perhaps that'll give you clues for 
ways to treat this and ways to tackle the problem. Certainly, uh, certainly important because there's more and more people being diagnosed with autism. I think a lot of that is they've changed the criteria for diagnosis, so more people are falling within that that spectrum disorder. And one of the well, the interesting things and the challenging things I saw, I think, in the press release, one of the researchers says uh, the phrase: "The bad news is there is heterogeneity out the yin yang." <laughs> yeah, I love that. So I thought that was great. I think they've just found this huge number of genes that it's, it's very complex. There's all sorts of different versions of them, so. It's a really big challenge. And, yeah, how, how do you think they might straighten out? Well, I guess, I mean, one thing I thought was interesting is that could perhaps be part of the reason why you see this sort of spectrum of autism-like disorders, I guess. You've got some people who are really badly affected, others who maybe just have some symptoms. And perhaps that could give us some clues as to what's going on there. I think larger studies as well, just to try and figure out really what's going on on a, on a much larger basis. Another interesting paper that I noticed in the uh, American Journal of Human Genetics talking about a Copernican revolution in how we view where we start comparing DNA sequences from. Um, What do you think about this story? Yeah, so this is very kind of revolutionary sounding in the way they talk about it, which was nice. And they're looking at mitochondrial DNA and how you should start comparing mitochondrial DNA from now, mitochondrial DNA from the past. Should we just be using mtDNA from white people or should we be looking wider and figuring out you know what exactly is going on and building up the data that we have I suppose I think this kind of stems from a lot of the genetics research that has been done over recent years has all been done using the samples that we can get which tend to be white European DNA and a lot of the genetic trees and work that's been done has kind of almost assumed that this is the centre of the genetics universe. And the argument here they're making that this mitochondrial DNA, which comes from uh, mother's eggs and is passed on, we should really be, every time we compare it, and, and maybe normal genes as well, should really start by looking at ancestral DNA and comparing forwards from that. They do, there's a lot of rhetoric in the story <laughs> yeah, about, definitely. you know, it's, it's a Copernican revolution and the world should not necessarily revolve around white male European DNA. Um, but yeah, I thought it was interesting to propose that for, for researchers, just the way they think about how they build trees. Yeah, and definitely now that it's so much easier and quicker to do all this kind of sequencing, that's going to have a big effect. And I suppose it just means you're opening up a whole new area where you can do more research and find out more and use more of that information. Another story that uh, that we saw that also involving this large-scale genome sequencing, but not in humans, but in fishies. What's this one? Yeah, I like this. This is about um, sticklebacks and how they've evolved. And they were actually looking at how the different species evolved to adapt in the same sort of way. And it's a sort of convergent evolution thing. So they haven't all come from one common stickleback ancestor. They've all adapted similar genes in similar ways, but independently, which is really cool. So there's like 21 different species uh, or different sticklebacks that they've sampled from different lakes around the world. Obviously, they are separate. They're separated by geography. But yeah, they found that the genes have changed in the same way to to help the sticklebacks adapt. I thought that was um, a really nice example. But um, it tells you about how evolutionary processes might work. And there was quite a sad thing I saw as well. Yeah, at the end, they were saying that um, some of the sticklebacks they were studying from a place called Bear Paw Lake are actually being threatened by some big pikes that are coming in, which are invasive predators. And, I mean, you know, you might, you might think, oh, it'll be, it'll be fine. They can, they can re-evolve themselves. But we know that that's not true. And every yeah. species is individual and unique. So, yeah, a bit, a bit of a sad, oh sad end to that. You can't evolve if they've all been it. And finally, there's a, st- a story uh, that I saw basically that starts talking about 9,000 placentas floating in plastic buckets of formaldehyde. Yeah, who on... wouldn't read on after that? I mean, <laughs> yeah. that sounds great. They, this really got me. And this is uh, about the Bristol cohort. What's, what is this here? So there's a slightly more kind of evocative name, which is the children of the 90s. And this was loads and loads of children, more than 4,000, that were kind of selected to be part of this massive cohort study. And they basically wanted to find out every possible thing they could about how these children started off in life, about their mothers, about their development as they grew up. So they've got all kinds of crazy information and tissue samples and stuff stored away that they're now finding exciting new ways to use. So they've got like placentas and hair and they've got all sorts of of data. And, And some of these kids are now, you know, 20 years later, they're now having children themselves. But what I think is really pioneering about this is that they were collecting samples and and 
placenta all this kind of thing before they really knew what they could do with it because back then we didn't have the kind of genome sequencing technology we have yeah and i mean it was quite there were some quite nice little kind of stories within this about you know what kind of things should we ask the parents about and it was just like you know let's ask them everything have you got a tumble dryer have you got a dog do you use pesticides in the garden it was just kind of anything that might possibly be relevant even in ways that they couldn't imagine at the time so I think, yeah, it's really kind of forward-looking research because they just didn't know how they were going to use this stuff, but now there's lots of different ways that they could. It's really blue skies. I, lo- I love the idea of someone going, this will be useful one day. It's, it's like your mum going, I'll just take that and put it in a safe place, you know, 9,000 placentas. Oh God. Keep an eye on that. Um, I'm sure it'll be useful one day. Uh, you haven't got any placentas at home? No, no, although I am a bit of a hoarder. So, I mean, you, you do never know when things might come in handy. And I think this is, yeah, that, that's, that's what science is all about. Thanks, Nell. And here's a quick roundup of the rest of the month's news. Scientists from the University of Illinois have found more evidence to suggest that human head lice and body lice may be the same species, something that's hotly debated in the world of insect genetics. The researchers compared the activity of genes in both types of lice throughout their life cycle and subjected them to a range of challenges such as heat or bacterial infection. They found so few differences between the two that they could arguably be classed as the same species. And interestingly, body lice can transmit diseases like typhus, while head lice don't. So the next step is to try and understand how this difference exists when the two species are so similar. A paper from Swedish researchers in this month's edition of The Lancet Oncology shows that people with Huntington's disease and other similar conditions actually have a lower risk of developing cancer than the general population. Certain neurodegenerative diseases like Huntington's are caused by gene faults that lead to an excessive build-up of specific proteins in nerve cells. At the moment, it's not clear exactly how this leads to a reduced risk of cancer, but the scientists hope it could shed light on some of the molecular pathways that underpin the disease and potentially lead to new ways to prevent it in the future. An international team of researchers have made an important step forward in understanding how nature and nurture work together when it comes to birth defects linked to faulty genes, according to a new paper in the journal Cell. The scientists were studying a relatively rare disease called congenital scoliosis, which causes babies to be born with a poorly formed spine. Using mice with a gene fault that mimics the human disease, the team found that even short periods of low oxygen during pregnancy, known as hypoxia, increased the risk and the severity of baby mice being born with spine problems. In humans, hypoxia can be caused by a range of things like maternal smoking, high altitude, drug use or medical conditions such as maternal diabetes or anemia. So the researchers think that the same mechanisms may be at work in human babies, increasing the chance of birth defects where there's an underlying genetic problem. And finally, new studies published in the journal Nature Genetics have shed light on the genes involved in Alzheimer's disease and brain development. Overall, the research involved more than 80 scientists at 71 institutions in eight countries. The first study, based on genetic data from more than 9,000 people, discovered that the hippocampus, the brain region involved in making new memories, may shrink faster in people with certain versions of four different genes, increasing the chances of developing Alzheimer's disease. The second study found two genes that help to control brain size by affecting something that's known as intracranial volume. That's basically the space inside the skull that your brain fills. As well as providing important clues about brain development and disease, the scientists also think these genes may have played a role in human evolution, helping us to become the brainy creatures we are today. And if you want to find out more about any of these stories, the references are all on our website. That's thenakedscientist.com slash genetics. We've already heard how genes control the growth of an organism from a single fertilised cell. But how do we know when to stop? Why do animals reach a certain size and then stop growing? And how do the organs inside our bodies know when they've reached the right size too? As you can probably guess, the answer also lies within our genes. To discover why we don't grow forever, I spoke to Dr Nick Tapon, who leads the Apoptosis and Proliferation Control Laboratory 
at Cancer Research UK's London Research Institute. If you look around you, you look at animals in general, uh, they all, you know, each species has a specific size and shape and there's not, I mean, there is some, some deviation from that, that specific size and shape, but by and large they're all roughly the same size. And it's a very you know, interesting question how that's achieved time and time again as the animals undergo development and have to grow from a very small embryo to a very large adult, how they precisely know when they've reached the appropriate size and shape. So we don't see fruit flies the size of birds, we don't see basset hounds the size of mice. Uh, Yes, that's exactly right. So this question has very interesting evolutionary uh, implications because, you know, related species vary quite considerably in in, uh, size and shape. If you look at dogs, for example, uh, dogs, you know, different species of dogs and even with, like, related species like wolves have very similar genetic materials or they're very similar at the, at the, the DNA, the level of their DNA, and yet their size and shape varies amazingly. Uh, and so that, that, that's a particular situation where very small changes in the genetic make, makeup of the species really has a huge influence. Presumably there are genes that are responsible for this. What do we know so far about the kind of genes that are controlling an organism's size? You know, so there are many different genes that have been, that have been found uh, to regulate size. The particular uh, genes that we're interested in belong to a, a signalling pathway, so it's a pathway that tells the cell how, how much to, to grow and to proliferate, and that pathway is called the HIPPO pathway. So it was discovered in flies, and uh, the reason it is called the HIPPO pathway is not because the, uh, the, the fly gets to be as big as a hippo, but the mutants are actually much larger and they, they become very uh, wrinkly, a little bit like the skin of the hippo, because there's so much tissue that uh, the, the cells don't know where to go. And so that particular hippo pathway, we think, is, is, is influenced by, by many different factors, really, in the, uh, in the developing fly, which allows it to, uh, to sense tissue size. What are some of the issues that influence how big an organism grows and how it controls its size? One particular issue is, uh, is, is nutrition. So as you know, we are what we eat, and uh, the, during development, how much nutrition the organism receives has a very strong influence on, on overall size. Uh, and so the hippo pathway, we think, does respond to, uh, to, to nutritional cues. In, in flies, obviously, that's quite, a, that's quite a big deal because, as you can imagine, flies are very much exposed to their environment and very often uh, they don't get enough food uh, or the, the, the larvae don't get enough food as they're developing. And so, therefore, they need very potent mechanisms to couple nutrition uh, intake or availability with, with growth during development. Uh, the other type of, of mechanisms that regulate the hippo pathway are to do with really the differentiation of the tissue itself, essentially. So, you know, they need to differentiate into a particular cell, into that particular cell fate. This differentiation process is coupled to growth because when you become differentiated, then you stop growing and dividing. And so the hippo pathway, we think, also influ- is influenced by the differentiation status of the cells. So does this help to explain why a liver's always more or less the same size in relation to the rest of the body? Your kidneys are always the same size compared to the rest of your body too? Yes, that's right. So this is a, a process called allometry, which is uh, that you need to coordinate the growth of all the organs in our bodies uh, so that they're, they're, the proportions are respected. So you can't have somebody going around with you know, a huge liver and a tiny brain. That wouldn't work very well. And so that needs to be coordinated, and that's probably done by uh, the organs communicating with each other. This is something that we still know relatively little about, but it's a very fascinating process, both during development but also in adults, because it's remember that growth control is not about just about uh, reaching the right, st- the right uh, size, which happens as you're developing from an embryo to an adult but also once you're an adult you have to maintain you have to keep sensing uh, the uh, the maximum size and you have to maintain that and that's a very interesting process as well because it it relates to to cancer diseases such as cancer for example where this process this balance which is called homeostasis goes wrong and, uh, and you start to get tumors for you and your research where are you headed next what are the questions that are really really bothering you we have many of the players that, that control growth, so the signaling pathways, we've, we've identified them, but we still don't really understand 
the the precise cues that these pathways are responding to. So in 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 particular, in the hippo pathway, what we think for the, or for the, the the case of the hippo pathway, what we think is that it responds to a physical the physical environment that the cells are in. So as you start growing, the the the, the kind of tension and the, the pulling and pushing forces that are sensed by your cells change. The the force balance within your body changes as as it gets bigger, and we think that this is this is ex- precisely what is being sensed by the uh, the hippo signaling pathway and that once the the force balance uh, kind of changes in a particular way then the cells are told to stop proliferating because you've reached the right uh, the right size but that's a very vague concept as you can imagine and we have very the tools for us to actually probe these forces you know we're talking about really physical forces here pulling pushing and the the, the tools to probe uh, these forces are still in their infancy and particularly if you're looking at a system which is alive which is you know a, a living system and so i hope you know in the future we, we will develop better tools to visualize physical forces uh, in developing tissues and that will tell us really how 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 these uh, how growth regulation is is uh, is happening because it's very easy to think about nutrition and chemicals and glucose or whatever affecting something, but to, to get a handle on what must be tiny atomic scale forces, um, what sort of technologies are you starting to look at? Well, for the moment, it's mostly to do with uh, ablating little bits of tissues with lasers, uh, which we can we can do in uh, in, in cultured um, Drosophila embryos, and that's you know that's certainly. That certainly works, but it's a very crude tool. It doesn't really give you kind of a very, very good uh, uh, handle on the exact extent of the forces. It can give you relative measurements, which is useful. Uh, but the what the future is made of is really using biosensors. So you've probably heard of biosensors in every context. You know, as uh, th- these are essentially reporters of particular physical processes, either physical or signaling processes inside the cells. That big. Uh, you know, big business in the pharmaceutical industry, as uh, they're used to, uh, to probe the the function or the the activity of drugs, for example, uh, on 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 our cells. Uh, we, you know, we and others are developing biosensors of, of physical forces that should enable us to really in situ or in in vivo uh, examine these forces but there is still you know part of me wishes that I had a a Star Trek tricorder you know one of these lovely little devices that you just flash at at someone and you get all of their physical parameters instantly downloaded onto your computer but unfortunately you know uh, uh, Mr Spock hasn't given me one of these uh, yet it's time to rummage in the post bag and answer some of your questions. First, Chris Finnegan in France asks whether it would be possible to genetically engineer humans to be able to drink seawater. Obviously, this would be quite useful as there's many places where it's hard to get fresh water and most of the water on the planet is salty. But unfortunately, humans dehydrate very quickly if we drink salt water on its own because our kidneys have to get rid of more water than we actually take in from the seawater to get rid of the extra salt. This happens because we can only make urine with a certain level of saltiness because the tubes in our kidneys that concentrate urine, known as the loops of Henle, are of a fixed length. Some animals, like the desert rat, can drink relatively salty water as they have very long loops of Henle and can produce very concentrated salty urine so they don't lose a lot of water with it. So, in theory, if we could find out the genes that affect the length of these loops, it's theoretically possible that we could genetically engineer humans with kidneys that can cope with drinking saltier water. But because the kidneys develop very early in life, you'd have to do this while a baby was growing in the womb, and this kind of genetic modification is technically and ethically very difficult. Now next, NASA asks about the effects of radiation. He says, Mutation occurs naturally through mistakes made in copying your DNA, and when your cells divide, mutations introduce more variety into the genes of a species in terms of survival. This makes it more likely to survive and breed. My question is, can nuclear radiation not only cause cancer, but also possibly cause mutation, so that future generations become better adapted to the environment? Now, I think the short answer to this is yes, 
Um, although large doses of radiation from something like an atomic bomb or a nuclear power station explosion are obviously very bad, any type of lower level radiation doesn't cause specifically good or bad mutations. It just causes changes in the genes. As we heard in last month's podcast, these random changes happen all the time and may or may not be passed on to the next generation. But if there's a selective pressure, then we see beneficial mutations start to spread through populations. I think it doesn't matter what causes them, only that they have to be passed on, so they'd have to originally arise in the sperm or egg-producing cells for humans and other animals. If you've got any burning questions about genes, DNA and genetics that you'd like us to answer, just email them to genetics at thenakedscientist.com. You can tweet us at Naked Genetics or you can post on the Facebook page. That's nakedscientist.com slash Facebook and we'll do our best to answer them for you. And finally, keep your hair on, because our gene of the month is the rather wackily named lunatic fringe. First discovered in fruit flies, the fringe gene is involved in forming the edges of a fly's wings. Mammals, including mice and humans, actually have three different versions of the fringe gene, called manic fringe, radical fringe and lunatic fringe, which are involved in the development of limbs and other parts of the body. In 2006... Researchers discovered that inheriting two faulty copies of lunatic fringe causes severe problems with the development of the spine. It's a condition known as spondylocostal dysostosis. And this comes under the banner of a number of hereditary spinal defects known as Yarko-Levin syndrome. Now, although the name lunatic fringe sounds amusing, it's much less funny to families whose children have been born with the syndrome. So the Human Genome Organisation Gene Nomenclature Committee, or HUGO for short, have suggested it should be just known as LFNG. Less creative, maybe, but probably less upsetting. That's all for now, and I'll be back again next month with a look at the world of top models. Not the skinny clothes horses, but the model organisms that scientists around the globe rely on to carry out vital research into genes and human health. If you've got any questions or feedback, just email me at genetics at thenakedscientist.com. You can also get in touch through the main Naked Scientist Facebook page, that's nakedscientist.com slash Facebook, and you can tweet at Naked Genetics. I'll see you next month for another peek inside your genes. (laughs) 